I'm Marty Kelsey, one of the hosts of STEM in 30, a TV show for middle school science students from the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Right now, I'm joined by Kathy Harper and Dave Dooling, and we're at the New Mexico Space History Museum. Thank you guys so much for talking with us today. It is absolutely our pleasure, Marty. We're delighted to have you. Welcome to New Mexico. It's gorgeous here, and we'll see some views here in a little bit, I hope. Yes, you will. Tell me how this museum came to be. Well, in 1974, the mayor of Alamogordo, Dwight Olinger, was, I, I like to tell people, he was just relaxing on the couch, watching TV, watching a show on um, the Baseball Hall of Fame, in fact. And he thought to himself, you know, there's been so much space history that's gone on in New Mexico, and there's no place in the world that recognizes the actual international contributions of men and women from everywhere. We should have a Space Hall of Fame right here in Alamogordo, dedicate it to the international community, and there you go. That's, that was his brainchild. He called a few of his friends, they called a few of their friends. Next thing you know, it was the biggest community effort ever seen in this area to create the New Mexico Museum of Space History and International Space Hall of Fame. Wow, well the building is amazing. I can't wait to get inside. It's gorgeous. Let's go take a look. That sounds good. Okay. Now the first place we've got to go is up to the fourth floor to start our tour. Our adventure begins here. Guys, this looks really similar to something we have at the museum in Washington, D.C. Well, you know, it is similar to something that you have at the museum in Washington, D.C. It is one of the three existing Sputnik models in the world. You've got one, we've got one, and there's another one at the museum in Moscow. Now, is this the scale that it was? Yes. Yes, it is. So this is what the world's first satellite looked like and to size and everything. That's what made the beep, beep, beep right there. And that kind of changed the world, didn't it? It certainly did. Now, Dave, this has a connection to Sputnik as well, right? Yes. Uh, not designed originally for Sputnik. It was to track the first U.S. satellites, but the Soviets, of course, beat us to the punch. And this is an excellent early example of crowdsourcing data. Uh, there were hundreds, perhaps thousands, of observers across the U.S. who would be along the expected ground track, and instead of looking up at the sky, they're actually looking down, the way that one is mounted, uh, into a mirror, which is then looking up in the sky. They would track it, record their observations, the angles, and so on, and then all the data would be averaged. Any one observer was probably wrong, but if you had enough of them looking at it at the right time, those errors would average out, and eventually the correct signal would come from it, and from that they were able to calculate the orbit of Sputnik 1 and later Sputnik 2 and other satellites. Wow. Kathy, you were telling me that this is one of your favorite artifacts in the museum, but it looks kind of like a plain model rocket. Why is this so special? Marty, don't let looks fool you. This model rocket was actually handcrafted by Dr. Werner von Braun. As you well know, he was one of America's premier rocket scientists. But it wasn't until after World War II, when he came over with the paperclip scientists, that he began working with our scientists developing America's space program. That had a very strong connection to this area too, correct? Absolutely, because after World War II, when the paperclip scientists came over to America, they actually came to America through Juarez, Mexico, and were brought to White Sands Proving Ground to begin their tests on the V-2 rockets here. Now tell me briefly, who are the paperclip scientists? Why is that a term I should know? Well, there were many scientists that were uh, working with Germany at the end of World War II, developing things like the V-2. And when the war was over, Russians and Americans worked together to basically divvy up the scientists. So the scientists that America wanted to bring, they put a paperclip on their folder, and that marked them. From then on out, it was called Operation Paperclip, and they were the paperclip scientists. Awesome. And this rocket is actually gives us an idea of the scale of this rocket, right? Right. Now, this is an RL-10 engine, and it is one of six that is in a cluster inside that Saturn one. So like the second stage, this is the engine that's there. That's right. Dave, we're looking at the Apollo Primary Guidance, Navigation, and Control System. This played a very real role in events that students may have seen depicted in the movie Apollo 13. 
Yes, shortly after the explosion on board the spacecraft, mission control is in chaos. The guidance officer leans over to Gene Kranz, played by Ed Harris, and says, flight, they're all over, they're all all over the place. If they're not careful, they're going to go into gimbal lock, which is a condition where you get the rings supporting the guidance gyros all lined up and you can flip it out of position. This was the hardware. This is not a mock-up. This is not a training model. This was on Apollo 13. This is what would, in other missions, this was what would guide them from Earth to the moon and back in an identical unit on the lunar module to guide the astronauts from lunar orbit down to the surface and back. And if you look through there, it's the same telescope and sextant that the crew would have used in navigating by the stars to get to the moon and back home. So when I look through here, wow. Yes. I'm actually looking through the same thing that the crew of Apollo 13 Right, through. and that would have been the keypad that they would have programmed the updates and all the controls that were used in space. That is so cool. This view is amazing. What all can I see out here? Well, on a clear night, Marty, you can actually see the lights of El Paso and Juarez almost 100 miles south of us. And as you look across the Tularosa Basin, you'll see jagged mountains over there. And those are the Oregon Mountains. Just this side of the Oregon Mountains is White Sands Missile Range. Next is Holloman Air Force Base. You see the white at the base of the mountain. That is White Sands National Monument and White Sands Space Harbor. And the National Monument has something in common with Mars. The spacecraft orbiting Mars have found dune fields that have a lot of structural similarities. As soon as they saw that, they came out and they did high resolution elevation mapping. And they're doing comparisons between what's here and what we are seeing on Mars. And going back to the south where the missile range is, if you're looking, it's hard to spot, but if you're looking at the right time, we can see sounding rocket launches where NASA launches science payloads, astronomy, and solar physics. We can also see tests at the high-speed test track. There's a little tiny dot way out there on the white sands. That's the beginning of the high-speed test track on Holloman. This is incredible, and a lot of this relates to space history here in New Mexico, and you guys have actually created the New Mexico Space History Trail. The New Mexico Space Trail identifies 52 sites across the state, from archaeoastronomy to Spaceport America and Virgin Galactic, related to space research, exploration, and development. Here. Tell me about this sled. This is the one that Colonel John Paul Stapp rode in his record-setting test run in 1954. And the purpose of the test was not to go real fast, even though we have 12 rocket motors in the back end, but to stop real fast. It was part of a larger program to understand what are the limits that we can expect of the human body of young men and now women if something goes horribly wrong, they have to eject from the aircraft one minute, you're nice and safe inside the canopy. The next minute, next second, you're blasted up into the airstream and you stop like that. How do we design the restraints and other safety equipment to protect them so they can come back and fly another day? So the whole purpose of this was actually safety? Yes. How fast did this thing go? It was over 630 miles an hour. It was, and the reason we call it sonic wind is it was just short of the sound barrier. So it earned... Colonel Stapp, the nickname fastest man on earth. Now people have gone faster than that, but in aircraft, he was on the ground and no human has gone faster than he did. And when he was in this, he basically was sitting here. He was sitting right there and slammed back initially as the rockets accelerated him. And then it runs into a water pool at the end of the test track to stop it. So then he gets slammed forward. Uh, the jargon that's used is eyeballs back and then eyeballs out. So he's being slammed forward uh, just as an aircraft pilot, a high-speed aircraft pilot would be if he or she had to eject. And suddenly you're in the windstream and that's stopping you, but your momentum is still carrying you forward. And we're not talking about the two or three Gs that you might uh, experience on a roller coaster. We're talking a little bit more. We're talking a lot more. It was over 40 Gs that he pulled on this thing. So 40 times the weight of gravity is what his body felt. 40 times his weight, yes. That More is, than 40 times. That is absolutely incredible. Well, thank you so much for showing this. Our story. pleasure.